You're listening to The Local Maximum, episode 171. Time to expand your perspective. Welcome to The Local Maximum. Now, here's your host, Max Clark. Welcome, everyone. You have reached another Local Maximum. And today is a bit of a milestone on The Local Maximum. Another milestone. Uh, because we did record in this room last time, I believe, Aaron. But uh, welcome to the show, first of all. Uh, and uh, today we are recording some video. So wave to the camera over there. I, this is a little bit of a weird setup. I know. I think we should have like multiple cameras, multiple angles. Don't you agree? B- baby steps. Let's, yeah, yeah. Let's let's not go whole hog into a new studio right away. Every time we do. So usually you get a new studio and it's all set up like a a professional podcaster and it's all set up and they have their things on the wall and everything. What I'm going to do is every time I record a video in here, I'm going to add one extra piece. Okay. And then it's going to, uh, and and people can guess what that one extra piece is. And then after a while, it will uh, look pretty good. What do you say about that? Yeah. I'm going to keep my eyes open for the Easter egg. Okay, cool. All right. So today we're talking about one of the most fascinating topics that, um, I think it's come up. It's called the it, it's called the fourth turning, and it is it's one of these theories of history. I become interested in this stuff first of all, um, as someone who is interested in emerging technology. Uh, this this kind of theory does not come up a lot when you talk about technology and people in who are who are who are doing startups and things like that. But social uh, social and political trends do matter. And so I feel like it's a big part of the puzzle. And this book has been talked about particularly in recent years because of how many, it's a, it's a 1997 book. It's by William Strauss, Neil Howe. Neil Howe is still, um, active, uh, author and he's on, on YouTube and and stuff. I believe William Strauss has passed away, uh, in, in the meantime. So when we say this is what he wrote, I'm I'm usually talking about Neil Howe, but I don't know who, who wrote what. Um, but, um, it's, uh, it's it, 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 a lot of people say, "Hey, this book is explaining a lot of what's happening now. All of the, all of the social unrest, all of the craziness, all of the, all of the things that have happened to us in the 2010s and now in the 2020s." And so I was like, "All right, I better read this book." And even though I didn't agree with it fully, it was it was a very fascinating read, and I'm looking forward to talk about. It. So I think what we're going to do today is first we're going to go into a basic description of what this book is saying what its theory of history is. Then we're going to evaluate, then, then I'm going to have a few words on like my evaluation of the theory, uh, what I think about it. And then we're going to look at some of the predictions that it made. Were they right? Were they wrong? And then finally, we're going to end with how do we use these lessons to adapt to changing times and who wins the fourth turning if there is a winner of the fourth turning. So I think that's, uh, that's my, my table of contents. Did I get that about right? I, I think so. We got a lot ahead of us here. Okay. A lot of ground to cover. Cool. Um, I feel weird because I'm not giving a, uh, I'm not uh, looking at the camera, but I guess this is, uh, this is what it's going to be like. Hopefully we can, uh, hopefully we can make it, well, whatever. Video we're, is video. We're learning as we go here. Yeah. Okay. So the book makes distinction between linear time and cyclic time. And they say a lot of us in the West look at time linearly. Uh, so we look at history as basically a list of events that are slowly building up to something. Um, even if you look at, you know, old religious texts, scriptures, uh, history is, is, um, is kind of running in, in a linear fashion, linear fashion. Well, sure. I mean, the, 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 the Bible is a book. It's got a beginning, a middle and an end. Uh, you know, when we talk about history, we talk about things on a timeline, which is the, the line is right in there. Therefore yeah. linear. It, it's, it's kind of built into our, uh, our expectations, yeah. our perception there. But, but there's also a little bit, so, uh, some cultures, uh, emphasize cyclic time as in time goes in a circle and things repeat itself over and over, kind of like the seasons or a life cycle. And apparently, uh, in many Native American cultures, they look at time in a, in a I was cyclical say, way. The first thing that comes to mind is the uh, the Mayan calendar, which I, hmm. I can't remember what year it was. There was a big deal that, oh, no, the Mayan calendar is, is coming to an end. Uh, and, and 2012, it was, yeah. It was, it was literally a giant stone circle was, was the, yeah. the item that... 
recorded the calendar. So I, I have a Mayan calendar. When you walked in, you saw I had a Mayan calendar on the wall. I got that in 2009 at uh, Chichen Itza. And, uh, I, I hope you got a good deal on it because us- usually when calendars are like almost at the end of their, their useful life, they <laughs> sell them for super cheap. I can't read the calendar, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. There's only three years left of the thousand-year cycle. Uh, but um, I, uh, I took a picture of myself with it on December 21st, uh, 2012, because I was like, this is the end of that. <laughs> To the end of that calendar. Um, nothing, nothing happened on that day, of course, although it could have marked the beginning of this fourth turning, for all we know. Um, that, that's probably as good a date as, as any. Um, but um, th- there are examples of cycles in, uh, particularly political cycles in kind of Western political thought. If you look back at like Plato and Aristotle, they talked about cycles in Greek history. Uh, and the the Bible also does have some kind some sort of like narrative repetition in it for sure, um, and so uh, yeah, this is just something that um, the authors want us to be aware of, and um, they they, they uh, want us to think about in terms of you know as opposed to something called Whig history, which is like the assumption that history is building towards something better and better no matter what, which is which is one way to look at things. There is progress. Like I don't some people say, well Whig history is totally discredited. I'm not so where, sure, but where, I just where does Whig come from? Oh W H I G. So like As um, in the Whig Party? Yeah. So it's like um it's sort of like um so I'm not really sure, but I, I'm assuming it kind of means like, you know, rationalist enlightenment gotcha. type uh, situation. Yeah, the, the Whigs haven't been a going concern in the U.S. for uh, a couple centuries. At yeah. This point. Yeah. They got uh, wiped out by a fourth turning. That's Indeed. actually true. Yeah. And, and we're so we're coming to one. So if, we, if you don't know what it is yet, uh, fourth turnings uh, wipe out social and political movements. So so what what are the four turnings? So basically, the book says there are a bunch of cycles in history, and the main one we want to talk about is this, I think it's a saculum or saculum, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, but it's essentially the length of a human lifetime, so 80 to 90 years, that, um, uh, so th- they usually cut it off at 80 so that it's a nice round number, and then they say, well, uh, usually things repeat itself just as... Uh, the, the world that you were born into is repeating itself just as you're reaching your kind of life expectancy. Now, you, uh, you mentioned before that this is not the con- kind of concept that you hear talked about a lot in, in like the tech sector. And I, I assume that yes. part of that is that uh, most tech endeavors are not thinking on the scale of a full human lifetime, that they're, they have much shorter horizons. Or well, do you some think there's people- a deeper rationale to why that's not? Really I mean, the Zetgeist, the well, Zetgeist. Elon Musk is, is certainly thinking in terms of long. Um, like uh, spans. If you talk to um, uh, Alan Turing and around the, the middle of the 20th century, you know, one of the founders of AI, he was talking about, well, I think AI is going to be here in 2050, 2100. So yes, certainly there are thinkers that are looking out, out you know, very far ahead. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's part of it. Also, I, I do think that technologists tend to look at the world in like the the Ray Kurzweil sense, where it's like we have uh, we're sort of just exponentially building to like the next um, you know uh, the, the an order of magnitude better chip, an order of magnitude um, you know speed up of internet, an order of magnitude more sensors, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's sort of seen as like a right. a build up of one layer upon the next. Technology is is uh, very much in love with things like Moore's law. Um, which, yeah, exactly. which do not Moore's necessarily, law, that's, it, it, that's, that's not cyclical. And so it doesn't really fit with this, uh, yeah. the, this, this seculum, uh, structure to history. Uh, yeah. al- although, uh, I, I, I haven't checked how it lines up, but I would imagine that the first and second industrial revolutions and the, uh, the computer revolution, uh, line up in, in, in an interesting fashion with, with, uh, some of these uh, cycles that that are being proposed. You know, I I haven't actually thought about that, and that's an interesting point. I kind of want to return because the emphasis to that. is much more on on yeah. social political rather right. than technological. But, so, but are I, they inter interwoven? Or yeah, not? I, I want to make the point that part of that one of the things that that he does mention in the book is that the uh, the where you are in the saculum kind of defines how technology is going to be used. So for example, the nature of Facebook today 
would have been different if Facebook was invented 40 years ago in a second turning as opposed to a fourth turning. So, um, you know, uh, uh, I think the example he gave was, you know, uh, television where in the first turning America, and we haven't even gotten into the turnings yet, <laughs> but in first turning America, television um, sort of meant conformity. Everybody was watching the same stuff for the first time and sort of it brought our accents together. We we're all getting the same news, same stations. But, you know, during the third turning, it was all about splintering and splinter groups. Now, part of that was the technology, but I think his argument was, well, no, if the television was invented and then it was a, a, a third turning, it would, be, um, it would be splintering from the get-go, even though you can only have a few channels versus, uh, you know, because it's, the, it's the, the, the social attitude of the people that affects the technology just as much as the technology could affect the social attitude of the people. Because I tend to think that a lot of our social problems stem or social, not problem, social um, uh, atmosphere stems from technology. I still think that. But after reading the book, it's like, hey, wait a minute. Maybe our social atmosphere is also affecting technology and how it manifests. Yeah, there's there's a bit of a chicken eggy situation going on there. Although the first place that my mind jumped to when when you were talking about technology being influenced uh, by the the which which cycle, which turning it's developed in. Uh, was since since I know uh, wars have a prominent place in in the turnings. Yeah, uh, that, that all certainly of them, by the way. war has a, uh, a very dramatic uh, impact on what technologies are brought to the fore, and even given the same technologies, how they are implemented. That you know, uh, it's it's the whole military industrial complex and kind of the DARPA thing that. Uh, just because an idea is going to be deployed in a very different way in the context of, of a military need rather than a commercial one. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's showing, uh, my, my, uh, my personal, personal and professional bias sneaking in there. Yeah. All right. So wh why don't I just talk about the fourth turnings and bring that up because yes, a lot yeah, of people take are... a step back to the big picture here. And, yeah. And okay. So each turning is 20 years. Um, and that's why I kind of think we talk about decades a lot because a 10 year is really a half turning and there's kind of the coming into it and the coming out of it. Uh, so, you know, I thought about that a bit. So the, the turnings that he gives are there, the first turning is a high where there is a high degree of conformity and basically, uh, the people in society are all on the same page and, um, people are, uh, are also can be like very successful uh, because society kind of feels good about itself. On the other hand, if you're kind of an outcast in that area era, you don't really have uh, a, m m you don't really have uh, anywhere to go. If you want to fix things in society, you don't have anywhere to go. So that's kind of the downside of the high, the first turning. But that's just the way it is. Um, and the second turning they call uh, an awakening, and it's usually kind of a uh, flourishing of new ideas. Let's say, so, you know, the high has lasted for a long time. And by the way, everyone who describes these things is describing them a little different. So this is my takeaway. Um, we just watched a video on YouTube that where somebody talked about his kind of conception of it, which I also noticed was a little different from the book, and I'll post that online. So this is my takeaway. The second turning is, is, is an awakening where you've had this high where people feel good about themselves, high degree of conformity, but now you get a little bit of pushback in terms of where society is going to go. This is when a lot of religious upheavals take place. This is when people kind of uh, seek spiritual enlightenment, seek new ways of doing things. Um, and uh, there could be a lot of turmoil in a second turning, just as there is term turmoil in a, in a fourth turning, which we'll get to. But the turmoil in the second turning has a specific um, flavor to it where it's more, it's spiritual upheavals. Um, and you yep. might have heard of the Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening. We all had to learn this stuff in high school, and I don't even remember half the stuff, but uh, those were all awakenings. Now, is, is that primarily internal as opposed to external, or is, is that not necessarily a generalization mm. you can make there? I think it's, yes. I think, I, I think he would say it's an external, it's an internal kind of uh I'm, I'm probably battle. Like, drawing like an internal toward the self type uh situation I, I hadn't thought of it that way I, yeah. was, I was thinking more in terms of like 
the nation and its people because uh, I'm I'm probably drawing too many well p- conclusions from our our current slash most recent cycle yeah which which started you know with with the post World War II era um, and and in in that case the 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 awakening would be uh, you know the 60s 70s and the the cultural upheaval yeah. that that occurred and he then. puts it in the early 80s too but, but that, it, that was very much kind of internal to the nation I, I there there was other, there was glo- there were global things going on there but we were much more concerned with with the internal and and I, I I guess it makes sense that that both the the within ourselves uh piece of that applies there as well yeah yeah so it's um yeah yeah so I I, I would say it's more internal but you could have you know one of the points that he makes is there's no there's no prescription on what events are going to happen. Like the coronavirus pandemic could have any time. Country could be attacked at any time. It's just depending on where you are in the saculum, uh, people are going to tend to react differently to that. So you got your second turning, um, spiritual upheaval. Third turning comes around. Um, now it's like, okay, people are kind of doing their own thing. And kids are becoming alienated, and um, and and uh, you know instead of arguing with each other like you do in an awakening and seeking enlightenment, people kind of seek more individualistic uh, goals. So, so this is the the polar opposite of of that era of conformity that, yes. that happens at the high. Yeah, it's we've we've had a, a, an awakening of discovery, and now everybody's pulling apart. Right. Right. Okay. And so you said it's the opposite of the high, right? You kind of see how you got from the high to the awakening, but now you are from the high to the awakening to the, um, uh, to the unraveling, right? Okay. So society starts to unravel. Um, you have individuality, so, which is good. We all grew up in, in, in unraveling. I feel like it's kind of a negative term, but he also describes it as like kind of middle-aged retirement if you're talking about the life cycle. So that's not necessarily a bad time. But um, uh, and, and oftentimes a lot of societies cash in. A lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, economic booms happened during this it, time. It included the, the, the boom of the 90s and, yeah. and the, uh, the, the early dot-com boom. And the 1920s. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, but what happens after the 1920s? Okay, so basically, you have more individuality, society pulling apart, and then you have to skip 20 years and get conform. You get back to the 1950s. How does that happen? Well, the answer is some crazy stuff has to happen in between, <laughs> and that's what's called a fourth turning, where there's essentially a series, a crisis, or a series of crisis crises that. Um, make people revamp the institutions and the way of thinking. And essentially, you know, one group kind of wins the fourth turning, if you could say that. Or if, I mean, look, if in case of American Revolution, I guess one group wins the fourth turning in America. Um, Britain is still Britain, you know, but, um, uh, uh, and I guess the Civil War could have gone the other way too, in which case we'd have two countries. But then you kind of end up in a in a in a stable piece at the end. So the 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 new order, the new the new normal, let's say, um, which is kind of scary when you think about it. When you, you know, I, I know there's a conspiracy, like you know, all the uh, all the rich guys at Davos are trying to uh, <laughs> impose a new normal on us or a great reset. And I actually don't think that history and events work like that. I don't think like a small group of highly influential people can just say, oh, this is the way things are going to go. I think they kind of lose control of things real fast. But um, it is, I feel like they're aware that they're, they're, they're like influential people are obviously trying to affect uh, this outcome, whether they realize it or not. Yeah. Well, and, and talking about influential people, uh, this this whole fourth turning seculum theory is uh I would say the the main counterweight uh, against the great man theory of history uh, that that it's it's not saying that so. What's there are, uh, what is great man theory? Oh, the, the the great man theory would well to to go ahead and 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 good win the argument right off the bat uh, that if Adolf Hitler hadn't been born, then World War II wouldn't have happened. Hmm. That that the the individual makes the history. Um, yeah. And and I I think that that Strauss and Howe would argue that. Uh, it it might have had a very different 
outcome, but the the critical conflict that happened would would it would still happen at that time roughly, and it would probably have a pretty similar nature, even if it wasn't uh, precisely Nazis fighting. Uh, you know, Axis and Allies powers and, you know, Mussolini and Hitler, yeah. uh, that, that other, other individuals would rise into very similar roles and we would have a somewhat similar outcome. Yeah. Um, I mean, they did say, look, war is not inevitable, you know, so a lot of this stuff is not inevitable, but it's just, yeah, in a fourth turning, that's when you could have a total war. And, and this and is, a, like we were saying before, this is counter to a lot of the way that we learn history, because when history is a bunch of names and dates, then then what can it be but the story of certain individuals who altered the course of history? And, and this is saying mm. that there, there, are, there are forces and powers in motion there that are not captured by that depiction. I, I, I actually, I'm not sure. I, I totally, I still think there's room for both because I still think it's like, hey, you could be a, a leader that comes along and you can change things, but you have to kind of go with the grain of the social moment at the time. So you can't, in other words, I can't become president in 1950. It was no election in 1950, but let's pretend. <laughs> uh, I can't become president in 1950 and, uh, you know, bring about a, uh, uh, bring about something, uh, a return to the 1920s, for example. Like that's just not possible. But who was president in the 1950s, Truman, Eisenhower, like they could have made very different decisions. And I think those two uh, men were actually pretty well suited for, for that decade. Sometimes they say there's, there's, there are leaders, who, political leaders who come around who are not well suited for their times at all, or they're trying to well, replay the battle. I was going to suggest left, that that's, but, that's almost a tautology because yeah. how, how could they not be well suited? Otherwise, they wouldn't have risen to that level. But, oh, but no, I no, guess no. there are some counterexamples to be Yeah, to be yeah, there are, there. there are plenty of counterexamples to that. Um, in fact, I think we actually have one now, uh, but, <laughs> but we can get into that. Uh, you, but you, you can pick your choice, whether we're talking about the current occupant of 1600 or the previous one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's sort of like if you want to be influential, you have to take that into account and you're not going to change where people are. It's, it's like you're, let me put it this way. Like if you're 25 years old. You can make good decisions, you can make bad decisions, you can alter the course of your life, but you're not going to be, um, you know, when you're 75, you're not going to be able to live like you were 25 and vice versa. It's just not going to happen. You have to like, quote, act your age, essentially. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, is, is sort of, and a lot of what they do is they speak in um, analogy, which is the way we learn. It's interesting, but I... But I'm always kind of careful about how far to the, does the analogy go because this is they talk about this they, they they use the analogies a lot of the life cycle of a human being to the saculum where obviously the the end of the crisis is is death and birth and they use uh, the season seasons the four seasons um, okay like I, I get why those analogies work but it's like how how far can you take those analogies I'm not so sure well, well to make maybe a, a slightly different metaphor um, you were talking about you you kind of have to go with the flow. Uh, with with the types of of changes and actions that you can take in a in a certain uh, a certain psych part of the cycle, um, there's there's a, a commonly d discussed topic in in particularly in the technology world. You know, an idea before its time that yeah. That, you can have a great idea for an innovation or a technology, but if it's if the time isn't right, it doesn't matter whether it's a great idea or not. It has to be the right idea at the right time, and and right. I think that's that's a little bit of what this is. And this could be in this case, we're talking about political ideas exactly. or social ideas as well, um, right? So uh, you 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 have um, right. Okay, so there's a little bit more to this. They talk a lot about generations because they're demographers and they talk about millennials and Gen X and boomers. People are talking about boomers all the time these no, did, days. Did, did you tell me all... that, that Strauss and Howe coined the term millennial? Yes, yes. Um, so, so we have them to thank slash, slash blame? Right. So your life experience uh, um, is going to be based on what part of the saculum in which you were born. In other words... What age are you at the crisis? What age are you going to be at the awakening? And if you're lucky enough to live a full life, then you 
live out an entire uh, saculum worth of events. Um, and some people live beyond that to see, you know, the, the, the next, uh, you know, to, to repeat a turning as well. So um, basically, these four generations, they, they have like archetypes of what type of person kind of grows up in that generation. So maybe I'll go through the four. Uh, which one do you want to start with? Uh, <laughs> Give me a generation. Any pick a generation. Any generation. Well, let's let's end with the hero. So so okay. to, to end with that, so, who do we start with? So we'll start with the artist generation. The last one of that is uh, so uh, the the last artist generation is the silent generation. They were born. So I don't have the dates in front of me, but they were born during World War II or uh, before into the 30s and, and late 20s. So my grandmother, for example, is a silent generation. And um, Joe Biden is the only president ever elected from the silent generation. Uh, Mount Rushmore has four leaders from four different types of generations. So um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt is obviously not silent generation, but he was from the artist generation before that. So they're called artists because they were growing up during a crisis. Current silent generation today were growing up to during the uh, during the, the Depression, World War II crisis. Um, not growing up, not like. Um, so I feel like. Well, so so not, children yeah. born today would they be the next artist generation? Right. So it's yes, but it's unclear. Um, to, to me, and, and I think this is after this book was written. So if I were to make the generations to line up with this book, I would say that millennials should go up to, um, say to the year 2000 or 2005, maybe. And then, you know, uh, the, the next artist generation should be Gen Z, uh, which starts, but you know, now they're saying Gen Z really starts in like 1995 or 2000. It's yeah, uncertain. Well, that's, that's part of the problem. Pro and problem are people born now, uh, still considered Gen Z? I think it's probably we're, we're beyond that, but I feel like the people born now are still living through the crisis a little bit. So I'm not so sure. Although, you know, the boomer generation does clip a little bit of World War, like a few years of World War II into it, just because if you were born in like 1944, you know, like uh, y you don't really remember wartime very much. Yeah. Part, part of the, we, we mentioned that, you know, it's 80 years to maybe 90 something. It's, it's, a, it's a little fuzzy and right. it's, it's, it's the same math that makes it tricky to definitively draw the line oh. at, you know, where, what year to what year are millennials and Gen X and it's, there's, yeah. there's some fudge factor in there. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so we, we, we got to the artist generation. Uh, the next one is the profit generation. Those the boomers, and that that's profit as in like a messiah, not as in yes. the the lord of capitalism. Yes, yes. So Moses, for example, is uh is in the the prophet generation, um, and you know they give the example like uh, so. Uh, um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the Exodus story, but you know they give the example of you know when Moses was. Um, I don't know, was the awakening when Moses killed the Egyptian or when he saw the burning? No, I'm pretty sure it was when he killed the Egyptian. That was the awakening where he realized that um, uh, you know, slavery, the, the slavery of the Hebrews is wrong, went to hiding, all that. And then when he comes back and does a whole bunch of plagues and stuff and, and, uh, and frees the Israelites, that's the, that's the fourth turning in that story. Uh, so it's the, the prophet is usually... The, the, the ones who are in the middle of their life, they're kind of hippies. And then the end of their life, they kind of lead the... I, I really need to go back and rewatch the Ten Commandments. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, right. So, boomers are, are, are prophets, uh, believe it or not. I've, I've gone through some examples. Uh, I'm not sure what examples they give in here. I saw a recent example of like, like Steve Jobs, I think would be a really interesting one from like a tech perspective. Um, but it's... Uh, um, all sorts of, I know, anyone in the boomer generation, uh, that's like a lot of people. Um, so, oh, so that generation kind of, they, they grow up in the fifth, in, in, in a conformist well, time. And Bill, then they Bill decide. Bill Clinton would have been a, a yes. boomer president, right? We've had boomer presidents from 93 to, to last year. Yeah. Uh, they, they were all boomers. Um, so you kind of grow up in the fifties and, 
you kind of, uh, you, you grow up in, in other areas, you grow up in a very conformist time. And uh, then when you're young adult, you have an awakening. So you kind of rebel, you're kind of the young adults who sort of rebel against that. Um, and then crisis happens when you're kind of a senior citizen. All right. So then the next block is the nomad generation. They are the, the most, the current one is Gen X, right? And so they kind of are children during the awakening. <laughs> and my takeaway from this is that while the awakening is going on, they're pretty much ignored and left to their own devices. And so I don't know, like kids in the seventies could just do what they wanted. And then by the time we came around, society was clamping, starting to clamp down on their kids. Mm -hmm. And now society's clamped down so much on their kids that in like Canada, they're like, if someone gets COVID in their class, keep your kid in their room and lock them in there for two weeks. So um, it's, it's, it's basically like we were kind of in the downslide of that as millennials. And I guess kids in the seventies were just allowed to, I don't know, maybe the parents were all, uh, <laughs> we're experimenting with drugs or something <laughs> and the kids were just like but it's, it's the stereotypical oh, like you know go ride your bikes go play stick ball in the sand lot just yeah be be home before it's dark yeah i'm sure that's true in the 50s too but um i feel like in the yeah so so in in, in the awakening i guess they're saying that the, the the parents weren't there and the kids just kind of have to fend for themselves so gen x tends to be um very independent minded and that's why when they're young adults, you've got the individualistic society and they are very like alienated kids. But, you know, as young adults, they are, uh, uh, you know, they can be, they can also be alienated as young adults, but um, they're also very good entrepreneurs. I think of Gen X people as entrepreneurs because most Gen X people I know in my life are actually pretty successful and very entrepreneurial people who are like 10 years older than me. I don't know. That's just my particular I, I can't impression. think of Gen X without thinking of uh, friends. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, don't know uh, what relevance that brings to this, but that's, that's my that's first the mental association. The age. I think of... You know, when we were growing up, you know, uh, boomers were like, oh, look at these kids making millions of dollars selling domain names. <laughs> Those kids were Gen X. Yeah. Um, and uh, and um, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of people in Bitcoin today are, yes, there's a lot of millennials like, like me and, and some other people, but a lot of Gen X too. Um, now, now, what Gen about X the is, NFT space? Is, is, uh, is, is Gen X too old for that? No. I mean, I feel like they're they're coming up with it. Um, so, you know, my friend Dennis Crowley has been on the show. He's he's a Gen X entrepreneur. Uh, I, I I I sort of think, yeah. But um, so uh, another kind of nomad generation. The previous one was the Lost Generation. I find this very interesting because I my great grandfather. I think he he died when I was six. And he was born in 1899. So I think, I always thought it was really cool. And they talk about this at the end of the book, how think of like the oldest person. He might not, they say the oldest person who like had an influence on you. I mean, I don't know how much influence you could have, but, but definitely the oldest family member who I met. He was born in the 1800s. That's pretty cool. Um, and so he was a member of this so-called lost generation. I think they're called lost because World War I happened and we lost some of them. But... Um, they were considered to be kind of the, the bad kids then, as opposed to the, what they call the GI generation, the greatest generation that fought in World War II. No, nah, they were, they, those guys had it together. But the guys in, in, who were born in the late 1800s, they, were, they, they had it rough, and they had to start their own businesses and you know, do what they can on the streets. And then 1920s came along, and you know, they were the people who were you know, having all the fun in the 1920s. So uh, that's, that's, that's sort of what, what Lost is, and it's sort of modeled on Gen X. They also give an example in uh, Star Wars, as an example, because they give a lot of, like, every story has some kind of constellation of... Uh, of, um, of, of the four archetypes. Of the four archetypes, right. So they're like, okay, well, Luke Skywalker is a millennial, uh, Han Solo is Gen X, and... Um, God, I almost forgot the, the, the other guy. Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's a, he's a boomer. Is it yeah. Lando Calrissian? No. Yeah, yeah. He's probably <laughs> no, also Gen X. Yeah, he's he's yes. uh, he's he's Solo's age group there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> so um, 
Uh, and that kind of makes sense. That kind of makes sense. And it's like, well, why would it be in Star Wars? Why? Well, it's because these stories are kind of written, uh, you know, the, the, the stories that, well, Star Wars is based on story structure that has previously existed. And a lot of these previously existing story structures ba is based on the repeating cycles of history. That's why they say a lot of this is in the Bible. A lot of this stuff is in you know, and, all sorts and of stories. it makes and, particular sense that a story like that would take place at the crisis. Right, right, exactly. Um, I, I, I am not familiar enough with uh, all the prequels to really go through and dissect uh, how episodes you know, one through three fit into the cycle here. But that yeah, because it's be not— some interesting work done there. Yeah, it's it not really— fall apart. It's not really an awakening, is it? It's another crisis. But that's, you know— what can you do? I mean, some people say that um, episodes one through three is really more like World War One, but I think I don't think the Star Wars universe is meant to respect the saculum. <laughs> I, I think it's just maybe you could find a different. Maybe it's another crisis, and you find a different. Oh, you find the archetypes. Well, so, in a so way. we we haven't talked in detail about the hero generation yet. Yes. Uh, so let's let's do that in just a second. But I want to I want to circle back to what you said about World War One because there, I think there's an interesting question to be asked yeah. there. But, yeah. But first, there's so heroes. much to talk about here. Hero generation. That's us. Okay. The good news is we get to be the heroes. Uh, the bad news is that might not be as good as it sounds. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's work. <laughs> yeah. Those are the people who uh, storm the beaches in Normandy, um, but. Uh, yeah, most of us are, are not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we can really live up yeah, to no, that. But nobody even showed up to Storm Area 51, so we're, yeah. not, we're not going to make it to Normandy. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess how many millennials were storming the Capitol? Uh, <laughs> probably quite a few. Um, but uh, I think that um, they also say some things about the hero generation that's not too flattering. Like, basically, the hero generation just kind of takes orders from the prophet generation when the crisis comes sort of unquestionably, like we could just be the, the foot soldiers. And they're like, well, if Gen X doesn't intervene in time, then it's just, it could just be a, um, it, it could just be a, a authoritarian disaster. But that, that makes sense if, if we're looking through the lens of, you know, World War II being the, the last crisis in the, in, in the previous yeah. cycle that, you know, your, your, your GIs, the greatest generation, they, they weren't old enough to be in, in leadership positions. Right. They, they were doing the grunt work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, we could have had some level of leadership in um, in the war, like um, I th like I th like uh, my grandfather on my father's side, who you know I, I never met, who died before I was born. I think was like a lieutenant or something like that. But you probably you weren't general. You weren't like a thirty right. year old general. Uh, so <laughs> the, yeah, the, the the big shots were being called by people like Eisenhower and Churchill, who were yeah. of of the previous generation. Right, right. Um, they were yes, yeah. Was, would, would that make them nomads? Um, or am I skipping one there? Yes, yes, they're nomads. Um, Churchill was born in the late eighteen hundreds, as was Eisenhower, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they were lost generation folks. Um, okay. And so, yeah, fourth turning. So how do those turn out? So we've talked about the last one. Let's actually give some, some more examples. So the, the previous one, 80 years ago, depression in World War II, that fourth turning is very unique in American history because it was kind of an external struggle with what was going on in the rest of the world. We had some issues with, um, rising fascism and, 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 and socialism, communism in the U.S. And FDR, I guess to his credit, kind of held it all together. I, on one hand, I think some of his policies were absolutely atrocious. On the other hand, they kind of staved off, you know, some of these uh, uh, policies. Well, I, I mean, th that I would put atrocious on these policies. Let's put FDR's policies as just, just, just merely bad. Um, <laughs> on some cases, they were. They were they were more than that. Well, and, but and, and you, I think you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, and right? this 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 internal uh, external thing it gets to what I was I was thinking yeah. about before and and why I was saying maybe I'm over generalizing from this specific case where uh, the awakening in the the 60s and 70s uh, you know was was very much a domestic kind of internal to the U S. Whereas World War II was uh, it's right in the name World War it was much global external facing uh, yes. how we related to the rest of the world. Yeah. Yeah, um, so it's not necessarily the case for previous fourth fourth turning crises. 
Yeah. Yeah. So some of the changes that happened within the U.S. over the last fourth turning, I'm not too thrilled about. So, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, we basically a little bit before the fourth turning, but we kind of confirmed it during World War II. We, we kind of gave up on hard money. That's something that maybe could be fixed in this fourth turning with Bitcoin, which I'll get in a second, or cryptocurrency. Um, you know, and, uh, and certain, uh, certain aspects of the state that were kind of put into place, like uh, you know, our entitlement programs and whatnot, that sort of came out of the last fourth turning um, and partially the second turning. Um, but, um, you know, that's, uh, that, that's, just, that's just the way it is. That's just who won history. And the great news of the last fourth turning is that the, uh, the Nazis didn't win. So I, I'll, I'll t- chalk that up as a win any day. Uh, despite what else happened, but let's look at, so, but there's no guarantee that, um, good things will happen in the fourth turning. Sometimes very bad things could happen. We've gotten very lucky over the last few. Let's look at the one before that. Take World War II, take now, subtract 80 years, World War II. Take World War II, subtract 80 years. What do you get? Uh, that brings us to the 1860s, does it not? Yes. And that brings us to the civil war. Um, society's falling apart. Slave states, free states can't coexist. Very bloody war in American history. Um, it ended with a, a good result that slavery is abolished and the country um, is is uh, is is stays together, but you know at tremendous cost. And um, so you got that. You know we can kind of glorify the Civil War, but who would want to live through it? Certainly, uh, and 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 that raises a question. Uh, having having not read that section in detail. How how is Reconstruction in the U.S. treated as? Because I some of my recent reading and listening has uh, not painted a rosy picture of that period. So viewing that as the high uh, might seem like a bit of a stretch in some respects. I think that's kind of an extension of the fourth turning a little bit into the high would be Gilded Age. Gotcha. So America. so the post uh, yeah. 1876 when ba- basically the end of Reconstruction. Yeah. Um, which. Well, look, uh, I, I think the some, high... Some dark compromises were made, but but it allowed the, the yeah. country to, to then go into a growth mode after that. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could say the high starts in New York City on like in like 1866 maybe, but then it, it doesn't start in the South. I mean, I don't know if you really have... I, I, I don't know history as much because, yeah, um, the, the South backslides for sure uh, during that time. Uh, but... One thing they don't do in the South is they don't restart the Civil War. Indeed. Um, because that's, that, that's not something that you do in a first turning. Um, so, again, first turning doesn't mean things are going well for everybody. And, in fact, if you're not, um, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're on the outside of the majority, things are not so good for you in the first turning, which my first turning can concern me a little bit. But um, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, Okay, there are wars in the first turning, by the way. There's like the Korean War is an example where you get in, you confirm the result from the crisis, and you get out, basically. Right, and uh, and and uh, there there are a couple of terms that were thrown around. I think coming from from other researchers talking about like probing wars or you know kind of smaller regional conflicts, um, not not the defining conflicts that that generally characterize a fourth turning, but but it's not yeah. necessarily a peer, a period of peace. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, much in the same way that the, the Pax Romana or, or the Pax Americana were not actually periods without war. They were just internal peace because all the fighting was busy happening out on, on the borders with the, 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 uh, the barbarians. Right. Okay. So civil war, subtract 80 years, you get the revolutionary war. Same sort of thing happening. Subtract 80 years from that. And you get some very interesting things happening as well. Um, a lot of things that happened in colonial times, I didn't realize they all happened around the same time. You have King's Philip's War, which is like this, um, the peace with the Native Americans was broken, and you have this horrible war uh, between the colonists and Native Americans. Then the British come in and say, we're going to now have direct control over the colonies. Colonists rebel against that, uh, and then they revert to more indirect control. They have a... Um, they have a revolution in England, the Glorious Revolution, that overthrows the Stuart dynasty. And then 
some other crazy things happen here. We have like the Salem witch trials and people getting killed left and right. And then uh, I just know that because in high school we did uh, we did the Crucible, which is a play on that for those who don't know. <laughs> and um, I was one of those guys who was, uh, you know, making sure people were put to death. And, um, oh, that's going to be edited out. <laughs> that's going to be edited in a very bad context. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then that finally came to an end. But um, that's, uh, w- which was kind of, uh, it would probably would have been a relief when all of those things came to an end for the colonists. And that sort of marked the sort of downslide of the Puritan era in American history, where after that kind of, I mean, I guess, I don't know what the high would be. Maybe people kept, I, I, I'm actually not too familiar with the high after that, but I know in the awakening period after that, you had lots of splinter groups from the Puritans. And, um, you know, by that's why by the time we get to the American Revolution, they say, well, John Adams was descended from Puritans and he was part of the church that was the Puritan church. But they never say like he was a Puritan because it was like, no, that was like a lifetime ago. Yeah, the the protestant uh sects in in that part of the country at that time kind of had, had drifted somewhat from the folks that came over from from england originally right okay so um there's interesting things about a generation first of all your generation isn't static so uh, it's not like you could say well this generation is very liberal and that generation is very conservative um sometimes that's true but also they can change over time and an interesting thing to think about when it comes to your generation is that not only does the general attitude of people of the individuals change as they get older, which makes sense. You're going to have a different perspective on life when you're 50 years old and you've lived through a bunch of stuff they haven't lived through yet than when you're 20. Um, but also, uh, different individuals get emphasized at different portions of of their life. So I kind of think of like um, like like the Gen X and millennial people that they mention in this book, I've never heard of them because that was from like 1997. And now there are different people who you would uh, talk about. The only Gen X people who uh, are millennial people that I recognize are the Olsen twins. Yeah, well, to, but, to, to torture a, a metaphor, perhaps, you know, the, the people who are, are the cool kids in high school uh, are, are not necessarily going to be uh, movers and shakers come the 10th reunion. Uh, so, right. you know, we, we, we see some of that shifting within the groups that all, all the same people are there, but... Uh, prominent roles are, are, are shifting sands. Right. Right. So I feel like, um, back in, in like the nineties who like, um, what was, what do you see Gen X as you said, friends, yep. you know, you might think, uh, Nirvana, I think like comedians, like, uh, Pauly Shore, who's heard of Pauly Shore now, you know, <laughs> where, where does <laughs> Seinfeld fit? Adam here? Sam. Um, I think he's Gen X. Yeah. So, um, he still could be relevant if he wanted to, I think, but not, but, um, anyway, so it's, uh, it, I just use Polish short cause it's so stupid that obviously it was not going to last <laughs> maybe Adam Sandler too. Uh, but like, is this a different style of comedy than you have today? Because it's sort of like, um, um, it's sort of like, oh, it's like, it's funny cause they're so stupid. Um, even though they're not stupid, like, you know, who else did that? Uh, Ashton Kutcher. And he's, he's like, uh, apparently a very smart guy and he's even an investor in, in Foursquare. So, yeah. Well, and, 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 you know, pl- play, playing dumb for, for comedy genius is, is certainly not yeah. a thing they invented, you know, going back to yeah. the vaudeville days and, and before then. Right. Yeah. But look, that is, that went out of fashion and therefore the people who were doing that kind of went out of fashion and different or, people. Or, or they evolved. Yeah. Or they evolved. Exactly. Um, so, um, so that's that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, okay, so <laughs> we just got through our basic description. We're already fifty minutes in. I don't know if we want to divide this up into two shows, but do you have any questions? Yeah. So so I, I wanted to talk to you about the World War One thing. Yeah. So uh, we we had labeled uh, World War Two as as the crisis of the fourth. Tournament. Exactly. Uh, and I can see why for the United States, World War One is 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 kind of just a blip. We I mean we yes. we we basically showed up at the end, a token force. Yes, there were casualties, but it didn't affect us in nearly the way that it affected Europe. Why was World War One not a fourth turning for Europe? Uh, so this book primarily focuses on the United States, and they do have a section in in your of Europe where they're like, um, my takeaway is like Europe's tainted. Because every country has every has a is in like a different phase right now, 
is in a different phase at different times, and they kind of clash with each other and affects their. I was going to say, I, I, I could almost see, but why... because the United States is so isolated, and even England to an extent, not isolated as much from Europe, but you know, still kind of self-contained, uh, then it kind of works for these societies. Hmm. Um, but you know, now they say since World War II was so global. Everybody's going through the same cycle at the same time. So now we might also be going through a uh, fourth turning at the same time, which could be pretty crazy. Yeah, I, I don't know if I buy that that Europe within itself is is so disjointed there. I, I could easily buy the case that Europe and America were out of sync with each other and, and that the development of faster international travel and, and global communications uh, forced those to come into alignment with each other. And that probably happened right around... World War Two ish. Yeah, no, I, I um, kind of, but, I, I actually think that that, um, and then this is not from from this book. This is my thinking. Is like obviously Russia is one behind because clearly the communist revolution is um, uh, was a was a fourth turning event, not like a not a third turning event, right? Right, and um, and and probably all of World War One in Central and Eastern Europe, and then the fall of communism well, was, also yeah, a fourth the, turning. The fall event. of Berlin Wall. Uh, yeah. I, I I I guess that is well, where does that fit in our in our cycle? From so our in our cycle, that's, so a lot of thirds. Interestingly enough, a lot of third turnings have wars that where you kind of win, but it doesn't like it, you know it doesn't solve your internal issues as much. So a good example so, would so be that would have been during our unraveling the yes, fall of communism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, another example of of that kind of war would be World War One or. The Mexican-American War, I think they gave as an example, where uh, Lincoln was a congressman during that, as opposed to the war. Um, and it's like, yeah, the United States oh, won the, the war. We the beat Mexico. War. I'm, I'm thinking of, of the, uh, the expeditions into Mexico in like 1905 in no, Black no, no. Pershing. You're, you're talking about uh, the, the war that uh, pre preceded Texas's independence. Yes, yeah. And, and yes, America won the war. But it it kind of exacerbated the internal issues that led to the Civil War. So same with French and Indian War leading to uh, leading to the Revolutionary War. So it's kind of like th those third turning wars. We don't really study them as much in history as other than like there'd be like a chapter on the main fourth turning, and then like the beginning would be like, well, there was this third turning war that happened, and then this well, so, happened. So would our global war on terror, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, is that a third turning war, or is that? the front end of, of the fourth turning, or it's, is it too soon to tell? I think I would say too soon to tell. Well, that's depressing. <laughs> yeah. It, especially if it means that we've got something uh, more dramatic in, in our immediate horizon. It's possible. It's possible. Um, all right. So I think we should wrap up this section and then go on to the next section. You can record it now. But uh, I think we're going to wrap this up for today. This is like the basic description of the fourth turning. And when we come back next time, we're going to talk about our evaluation of the theory all the way down to what do we think is going to happen um, in this fourth turning next time on The Local Maximum. Have a great week, everyone. Stay tuned for that. That's the show. To support The Local Maximum, sign up for exclusive content and our online community at maximum.locals.com. The Local Maximum is available wherever podcasts are found. If you want to keep up, remember to subscribe on your podcast app. Also, check out the website with show notes and additional materials at localmaxradio.com. If you want to contact me, the host, send an email to localmaxradio at gmail.com. Have a great week. Feel the power.